people don't know who you are, how you are, how you get to where you got to, you know, uh, and so they, they just see the facade that, 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 that you kind of, uh, that, that you wear, you know what I mean? I come from Kashmir. I was born in Kashmir, um, 13th of August, 1962. So in those days, uh, over there, there's no electricity, there's no running water. You know, if you want to cook a meal, yeah, you have to literally go to the nearest forest, break off some wood or whatever, collect the wood on the thing. You have to go to the nearest spring, get the water, you know, and it was hard work. That's when the alarm bell started to ring. He says, uh, I want you to look after somebody for a while. Yeah. I went, what do you mean? I've got to look after someone. What do you mean? And he's gone, I'll brief you when we get there. Yeah, now he's dropping this plot on me. They're about to carry the death penalty out. Right? And we've got to do something. I said, well, what, what, yeah, what do you think you could do yeah, to stop that? He said, well, we're going to kidnap the high commissioner at the consular, at the Indian consular in Birmingham and we're going to hold him hostage. I'm just flabbergasted, you know, and I, 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 I can't think of a way out. Uh, I, I realise I'm properly stuck. Mm. And now I'm thinking, what's the kind of least I can do and, and, and slip away? I've gone, uh, what are we doing? Because I'm expecting him to say, oh, you know, I've got somebody and you can go. Yeah, and he's gone, um, no, it's bang on top, uh, we're going to go out and shoot him. Oh, mate. They should have locked us down, because everybody knew what was going to happen. Mate, they opened us up, it just kicked off big style. The others, they just got stabbed and cut. And I mean, literally, the landing was full of blood. First time he meets you, he wants to create an impression. So he's running around and he's doing kind of like little nutty things and you know going what to like? uh, you know going to where the screws uh, boxes and making mad noises and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> and you know, I'm thinking <laughs> I've never met him before. I don't know who he is. Even Mickey Peterson at that time, you know. <laughs> he says to me, "Sir Moy, I want to write a book, Living Legends, yeah, and I want to put you in in my book." All right, you're in for a treat today. Mo is telling his story exclusively on this channel for the first time. He has served 20 years in the UK prison system. He's been to all kinds of prisons across the country, especially in the north. And he has served time with many high-profile prisoners, Charles Bronson, the Craze, just to drop two names in there from the get-go. So Mo is going to start out with one of his most interesting stories from the prison. And then we're going to go right back to the beginning and do his entire life story. His book is 300,000 words long presently. It's a trilogy. So this might be a whole series of podcasts. And we're going to work on his book, get his book published for him as well, hopefully. And um, we, we look forward to doing a lot with Mo. And as you can see... He's just such a good vibe. He just, <laughs> he's got that yummy bee energy, he just yeah. that smile and that, that yeah. same positive energy that just fills the room. And, yeah. you know, when he sent me a message and I looked at his channel right away and I saw that energy, I thought, right, we've got to get more on. And I've, I've been speaking to him now for the past few weeks. Co-host today is Jen. Hi there. Of Boomer and Jen, organic cotton clothing company. All of her links are in the description box below this video. And we're getting lots of comments on the clothes that she wore. Yes. And that, that's a really nice top. <laughs> so today um, I am wearing actually Nomad's clothing. They are an organic cotton yeah. clothing business, also online. Mm -hmm. I don't currently sell their stuff on my website, hopefully soon. Uh, but no, uh, this is their jacket and their shirt dress I'm wearing today. Mm -hmm. Check them out at www.nomadsclothing.co.uk. Very smart. Thank I want to get you. Some from me, Mrs. Yeah, Link, they've got 
will be in the description box. I like your blue and white <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right. So, what story are we going to start out with then, Mo? All right. So, I was in Gartry about two years by this stage. I went to Gartry in 85. So, talking about 86, 87. And this guy, Mickey Peterson, turns up. And one of the guys who's like my friend there in uh, Gartry, Mickey Ahmed, had known Mick in uh, Hull. And um, so he introduced, and the thing is, right, so the, we've got a bit of a background because I'm from Luton, right? So my family and all that are from Luton. <laughs> He's from Luton. When we actually spoke the first time we had a chat and stuff like that, I found out that he'd been living on uh, Longcroft Road or something, which when you go down comes to Ashburnham Road, which is the same road that I used to live in. So, you know, but it was like, you know, 10 years difference or whatever. So, and as you know, he started off with a seven-year sentence and he got knighted off three times. Did you know? he rob some jewellery or something, was it? Uh, the first one was, no, I, the first one was a, a bit of money out of uh, a, a chippy's till. Right. There was a couple of quid or something. And you know what, the sentence they gave him was horrendous. And he was Mickey Peterson at that time. And he was a lump, you know. And when you go into jail, you want to be associated with the people who are like... Uh, I've, I've got the most clout, yeah? Mm. And the most clout in those days were, like, the London gangsters. So he was, like, you know, around there, you know. And he, you know, at that time, nobody knew who he was and all this lot, you know. So anyway, so he'd kind of made the name for himself, you know, knocking screws out, this one, that one. He'd got nutted off, as I said, three times. When, when I say nutted off, what they used to do is that if they can't deal with you in those days... They used to send you off uh, to a, a Broadmoor or Ashworth or whatever it was, Park Lane. And they'd keep you for 18 months, uh, review you and, um, y you know, find you that, they, that you're sane or that they can't deal with uh, you on a chemical medical level. Then they send you back to the prison. But the time that you've spent, because it's a hospital, it's not prison it doesn't count on your sentence. Oh, doesn't it? That's why I he didn't did... didn't know that. That's What's why that? he so did... if you're going to the hospital... If you're going to Broadmoor, it doesn't count. That doesn't, why? That, yeah, yeah, no, you're why in a... Because you, you, you're not in prison. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a secure hospital. It's a mental hospital. But surely hospital. you're still being knocked up. You, that's neither here nor there. We're talking about the law here, you know. The <laughs> final, we're talking about the finer points of the law here, and that what says is that when you leave the prison, you go to a mental hospital or whatever they call it clock these days. Clock stops. Clock yeah, stops the clock stops, yeah. So this, so this is what used to happen, yeah. 18 months, they, they, you get the review. Uh, six months later, they go, right, back to the nick, and you've done two years, but you're starting from two years. So he done that three times. So that's why out of his mm. seven years, even if he'd lost all remission, he should have still only done seven years. But he actually did 13 and a half. So anyway, we're walking around Exercise Yard, and Mickey Armid introduces me. And because he, he, you know, the first time he meets you, he wants to create an impression. So he's running around and he's doing kind of like little nutty things and, you know, going what to... Like? Uh, you know, going to where the screws uh, boxes and making mad noises and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> and you know, I'm thinking I've never met him before. I don't know who he is. Even Mickey Peterson at that time, you know. Yeah. So anyway, walking around, get to know each other a little bit, and all you know, just chat and all this. Like he was on A wing, I was on D wing, and um, <clears throat> so he's uh, he says to me, Mr. Moy, I want to write a book, Living Legends. Yeah, and I want to put you in, in my book. And one of the other people he wanted to put was a guy called Ronnie Abrams. I don't know if anybody's mentioned Ronnie Abrams. Ronnie had, I think, killed his mother and father, and he was on his skinny... We used to call him the Screaming Skull, yeah? He used to do <laughs> yoga out on the yard, you know what I mean? Doing like, really mad poses, and he'd have these mad uh, headphones on with, you know, the music dead loud, and he'd be doing all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the Screaming Skull, you know? So <laughs> at that time, you know, I says to him, yeah, right. and I, hey, I, did, I didn't think he'd write the book, yeah? And B, um, when I saw that, that you know, and plus I'd, I was in for a political offence, so I was keeping up a kind of a, a front as well, yeah? So I thought, well, you know what I mean? It's never going to happen, but, you know, if it does, I said, I said yeah, all right, mate, whatever. So <clears throat> anyway... Um, a few weeks later, I think, no, 
I think, yeah, no, this was 86, so, yeah, Reggie Cray was already in that jail, so he was dealing with Reggie at that time, and he wanted to um, uh, get into bare-knuckle boxing when he got outside. So um, there was a time he's, he was at the, uh, going to the canteen you know, from A-Wing, and they were doing one-for-one, one, and he wanted to go, and the screw was going, listen, Mick, you know, he's, he's wait, and... You know, there's one coming and he, he and next thing you know, it's giving him a clump, yeah. So now they've took him down the block, yeah, and <clears throat> so they're thinking we can't keep him up on the wing, cause this is gonna happen. Uh, we've got to keep him down here until he's released, yeah. But they've done a little kind of a regime for him, yeah, so he can come to the evening classes of the education, and he can. Um, he can go and exercise with us, you know. And uh, I don't know if you know, in the summer, uh, they let us out for an hour in the evening as well, you know, out on the big yard. You can sit down, you know, get a bit of sun. You know, maximum security jail. We're doing, you know, we're doing, we're doing long sentences, you know what I mean? So what are we going to do? So anyway, so he's down there and he's pumping away and stuff like that. And, uh, and then he gets out. And then, uh, then I don't see him for ages. And the next time I see him, um, he, he's, he's, he, he was explaining to me the stories about what had happened when he got out. <clears throat> so he's, he's telling me the story about the, the jewelry thing, yeah? So he's gone, Mo, what's happened? He says, uh, I, I had this girlfriend, she was a 17 year old girl or something like that. Oh. And he's walking around, um, you, you got to bear in mind, he was about 21 when he went in. And believe me, jail mm. pickles you, it does. Yeah, when you come out, you still, still think that you're 21. I actually asked Sean that the other day, yeah. um, didn't I, about while you're in prison, is it almost like time stops on your age? Yeah. Yeah. So you... Time stops when you start taking drugs as well. Yeah, yeah so, you, well. so you, obviously you go into prison, say, hypothetically, yeah. like you said, uh, 21, yeah. you come out at 35, but yeah. when you but come you out at 35, you still feel 21. 21. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is totally. that the case? Yeah, totally so. Totally yeah. so. I, mean, I, yeah, I was talking to a guy uh, in the taxi last night and he's going, uh, and when I mentioned the age, and he's like, nah, but you're, you're going around like a teenager. I'm like, mate, you know. But that's a long story. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening? Yeah. So, he's, 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 so he's telling me this story. Yeah. He says, Mo, he says, we walked past this uh, jewellers, I think it was in Hatfield, in, in that Hertfordshire area. And because he wants to look tough, yeah, he's gone, uh, which one do you want then? And he's pointing at the rings, yeah. And she thought, well, he's a big arm robber. So she's just pointing at a two grand. You like the, the most, most expensive, expensive yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. So she's got the most expensive one, yeah. So now he's gone and he's <laughs> telling me this. He's gone. He said, Mo, he said, I went back and I'm talking to me, Uncle Charlie, whatever. Yeah, he says, uh, what should I do? And he's gone, well, you know, if that's what she said and that's what you said, you got to do it, you know what I mean? So anyway, he goes round. Puts the thingy on, yeah. He's gone in, he's given the geezer a clump, he's got the tray of rings, he's sold all the other rings and give her the two grand ring. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of days later, if it was that much, yeah, the cops have turned up, Ella, mate, you know, and she's got the ring on and everything. Ah. Flashing it, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So he gets seven for that. <clears throat> so he'd got seven before he did um, 13 and a half, yeah, and now he's got seven this time, but he's actually got out. Halfway through, he did about three and a half, got out. I uh, got out and then they were plotting up on a, a bank in, uh, if you don't, uh, so in Luton, uh, Marsh Road, yeah, end of Marsh Road, there's like a big roundabout, there's a hairdresser's next to us, like a little Barclays or something like that, one of those little kind of single story buildings. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so, yeah, so he's, um, and he's got these guys, you know, that to come to do the bank robbery with him, yeah. But he didn't know this was a ready eye, so like somebody's already sold the police and they're already waiting for him, you know what I mean? So as they've gone there, the, the, the cops have, you know, grabbed them and stuff like that, and, and then he's trying to come up with a story about... <laughs> Why he's there with a sawn off shotgun and a balaclava. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So he's saying, Oh, well, he says, uh, No, I wasn't going to rob the bank. 
and the hairdresser's next door, there's a girl in there, I fell in love with her and she blanked me and uh, whatever and then I was going to go in there, yeah, profess me undying love, yeah, and then kill myself. Yeah, that was that was the story about what did the gun, but you know why the balaclava? Then <laughs> you, you know what I mean. But you know, these things happen, you know. So anyway, that's when he got the wow. other seven. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, it was the Iraqis, the hostages, and stuff like that. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So in '95, I was in um, Franklin, which is up in Durham. And my family's in Luton. Um, I want to come down for visits, and you can do that 28 days. Uh, you okay, you save four, you save three uh, visiting orders, and you can come down and 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 use them um, to in a prison near where your family lives. So yeah? they travel you down. So you mm. save three visits. They travel mm. you down to said prison closer to Luton. Yeah, the one that you that you choose. Yeah. So I chose. Bedford, Bedford's really close to Luton, so I got to, I got to Bedford, and uh, oh, I was terrible at this. By this stage of my sentence, I was a nightmare, a pain in the ass. You know, I mean, you name it, yeah. And <clears throat> I get I, I get a letter off uh, Charlie, and by now it's Charlie Charlie Bronson. Sorry, and even before that. Um, when he'd got out, he'd, he'd sent a picture for Sid, uh, for Sid, yeah, for Sid Draper, yeah, the one who escaped uh, yeah. Gartry in a helicopter, yeah. So anyway, um, I get I get a letter, Mo, I'm writing, Living Legends, I want you to really send me a picture of yourself. And I'm, me, I know, you know, I don't really want to do that, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know what I mean? You're trying to play <laughs> so, it down. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I pretend yeah. I never got the letter, in it? Yeah, pretend yeah. I never got the letter. <laughs> 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 do you know what I mean? So anyway, so I go back to Franklin. And he's, by this stage, he's done his rounds, Woodhill and uh, Wakefield. And he's down, the, I think he's on the ghost train in Franklin, you must you've heard about that the good order and discipline every twenty eight days, you know. So you, you you're there. It's like diesel therapy, isn't it, in America? Right, I don't know. No, what, what is the ghost is. train? Sorry. Right. So what happens is, yeah, if if once they really can't deal with you, yeah, what <laughs> they do is, yeah, they, they they send you from one jail to another. Now, if you're in a jail for twenty eight days, then you get to see the the board of visitors or whatever they are now. Yeah. So somebody independent gets to see what's going on and you can say well look yeah this is what's going on yeah but what they do with this good order and discipline is they, 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 they'll, they'll uh, send you to a jail and 27 days later they'll send you to another jail and then 27 days later they'll send you to another jail so but you're just doing the blocks of all of these jails, you know, I've, I've had mates who, who've done that for like, you know, four or five years, you know what I mean? In America, like, it's called diesel therapy yeah, because of the prison okay. transportation van. You're always on the prison transportation yeah. van, basically. Worst thing is, you, you want to settle in somewhere and get established. Yeah. yeah. If they're constantly moving this you around, it's horrible. Yeah, this yeah. is the one. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm walking down the... Um, I'm, well, I was, I, you know, I, I, I really, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't have been down the block as many times as I did. I, in the end, I had something like a hundred nickings, you know, and um, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we're going to get to them a <laughs> hundred nickings, infractions, yeah, 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 disciplinary yeah, infractions, yeah, 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 being placed on report. You know? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I'm walking around. Oh, I'm always all right, uh, uh, chill, and he's gone. Uh, uh, how come you didn't uh, reply to me later? How come you didn't send me the picture? Yeah, and I went, oh, Char, you know, I, I, I you know, just bottled it basically. I said, look, uh, you know, you know what it's like. They, they're probably, uh, you know, what the, the screws are like. I never got the letter, mate. You know, what I mean, they're probably. Just, so what uh, was in this letter? No, he was saying, send me a picture of yourself. Why, why did he want a picture? Because he wanted to put it in his book, Living Legends. Oh, so he did want you to write a story. But that would or... that would have put Mo on the radar then of, you know, 
the police are watching things like that. So if he puts a book out with him as a, le- yeah. a criminal legend. Yeah. Then they're going to come. Yeah. Mo's going to yeah. be on the radar. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to yeah. be on the radar. He wants, exactly. to, he wants to keep a low profile, yeah. Yeah. so he didn't yeah. want to be in the book. Yeah, yeah. Plus, and you, you know, plus I'm in for kind of terrorism anyway. So this is not <laughs> the kind of thing that I want. Doesn't want to make the situation worse. When yeah. you go to an appeals board, do you know what yeah. I mean? Or, or, or you go to um, probation or whatever. When you when you're about to get out, you got to speak to people to get out. Yeah. And if you're in the book as living, a living criminal living legend, legends, yeah. they're going to use that against you to yeah. hold you in prison yeah. longer. Of course, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you didn't so, fancy sending your photos. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what happens then is, uh, <clears throat> as I'm going back to the wing, he's going, oh, say hello to the boys for me. So I go back on the wing, I'm walking down the landing, I'm walking, I walk past Sid Draper's cell, and I went, oh, Sid, by the way, uh, Bronson said, hello, he's gone, that. And I went, what? What's what? And he went, don't you know what happened in Frank, uh, what happened in Parkhurst? I went, no. He's gone, well, uh, so uh, now I'm straight in, you know, I've gossip, I love it, you know. I <laughs> want to hear a bit more, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I go straight in his cell, so now he's gone, uh, um, he, was, he, he had this job uh, uh, digging a fish pond. In Parkhurst, on the on on the, you know you can't make it up really, you know what I mean? It's supposed to be like the most dangerous prisoner in the country, and they're giving him a, a spade, yeah, and he's out there digging a hole <laughs> on the exercise yard with the football pitch there and everything. Yeah? Good exercise, that. Mm-hmm. Digging Do you know a hole. what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. So um, so he says um, he was digging a hole, and um, Desi Cunningham, Desi's like like um, I said, Desi's like. South London kind of armed robber, kind of aristocracy, you know, these, they, they, these are kind of like little legends in their own world, you know what I mean? They, you might have heard, come across uh, uh, terms like the chaps or faces, you know what I mean? Chaps are the ones that these aristocratic kind of things and then the faces of people who like, you know, everybody knows who they are, you know, every time they go to a different jail, bump, you know who he is. In America, they say the fellas. Right, yeah. Mm. So, uh, so, yeah, but it's, it's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so he's gone, uh, so Desi's jogging, and uh, um, Charlie's gone, oh, all right, Des, I, I don't, have, you, have you ever heard it? Because he does talk, he, he's, he's got this kind of, all oh, right, mate, he's got that thing. He went, all right, Des, and Des, I don't know whether he had earphones in or whatever, but he was jogging away and blah, blah, blah. And he hasn't said anything. And on the next lap round, uh, Charlie's jumped out of the, uh, uh, the hole and he's gone, why are you blanking me? <laughs> and he's gone, what are you talking about, you mug? You know what I mean? And then Bronson's only giving him a fucking backhander. Yeah, and now this is like, whoa, you know? Yeah, and and you've got to remember that they're all the team. All the the bank robbers and the armed robbers and all that lot. They well, when it comes to South London, they're all a team, mate. You know, and and Bronson is really an outsider, and he has been all that way because he he does it all by himself, isn't he? You know what I mean? He's kind of like his persona that he's made. It's a it's a self created. He's created himself, and you know what he puts out is what he likes to show. Do you know what I mean? So bang, this is what's happened. Uh, so Sid's telling me this story anyway, I wasn't <laughs> there. So as the exercise is finished, uh, Dennis Arif, one of the Arif crime family from South London, he's come up one side of him, got one of his arms and somebody else on the other side, and Desi's come up behind and went, stab, 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 stab. Whoa. Yeah. So he's just about managed to make it to the wing, Bronson, and went, boom. Yeah. Now it's bang, they're all like, well, get the, the ambulance, all of that, yeah, get him sent to a hospital, and he's just about made it, you know, um, and they, they reckon he flatlined a couple of times on the way, but they managed to save him, you know what I mean, so, um, <clears throat> so I'm, I, I'm, I'm like, oh, Obviously, I didn't know that, but at that time, so the Cockneys were going a bit, little bit like, is a loose cannon. You know, that's the way they were thinking about it, is a loose cannon. You can't, you know what I mean? So, um, but there was another kind of an uh, uh, issue going on as well, yeah? That there was another story attached to this, yeah? So there was a guy called Frank Verdi 
who back in the 90s, he was from Leeds. He's dead now, God rest his soul. He, actually, when he died, it was in the news of the world. And he was running away, obviously finished his sentence, running away from a robbery or something, had a sawn off shotgun tucked wherever, I jumped over a wall, and he accidentally went off and ended up killing him, you know what I mean? Please. But Frank, it was a, uh, I found him to be a nice enough guy, you know what I mean? We got on well and everything, had curly hair, he's... He, uh, um, you know, about your kind of height, and uh, and uh, his, his his family was supposed to be big in Leeds, you know. What I mean, the drugs the scene and all that lot. So uh, and <clears throat> something had happened in Paul Sutton. So this is the story, because you know everybody gets to hear all the stories, yeah. So um, so this uh, was a story from this guy Stevie Doyle, who's from Liverpool. And, uh, you know, we got to be quite good friends in Franklin. And Stevie was telling me this story about Frank, that Frank had been um, in Paul Sutton and he was serving heroin up. And he, uh, um, I think he was serving up this guy. He was like, you know, was short of stature, a little bit like myself. And uh, the guy had, he said he'd pay on a certain day and, you know, he couldn't. And, you know, a lot of people find it understandable. You know, these things happen, you know what I mean? You'll get it, mate. You're not going to run away. You know, we're in maximum security prison. So anyway, this little guy, he, he had a bit of a protector, you know, he was a, a, a big um, Scottish guy. So, um, and the Scottish guy went to Frank, said, look, you know, leave it out, Frank, you know, blah, 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 whatever, yeah? So... And so the next part of the story I hear is that the Scottish guy has a cell search, a spin, yeah, and they find um, a debt list and a few bags of heroin there. So they got him marked now as a dealer. Mm. So what, what's happened? No, the thing is, yeah, the thing is that somebody has put a note in the box, mm. but he's not, he wasn't a dealer. We know who all the dealers are. Mm. So it seems like that, you, that, that so it's coming back on Frank now. So the lads are going to Frank, you've done this. So now I don't know what he can say or what he can't say. But it went off bad style and Frank got slashed to pieces. I mean, seriously, you know. So <clears throat> what, what used to happen then is, uh, so he's ended up in F2 in Parkers. I don't know if you heard about F2. No. Cooper's no. Troopers. Oh, well, these, this is like, you know, they, these are kind of the, 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 the proper stuff of the 80s and 90s in British prisons, yeah? F2 was like the last staging post before you get nutted off. Mm. And the, the, the main doctor there was a guy called Dr. Cooper, who uh, apparently, according to legend, uh, he was found uh, dancing around naked in a forest, you know, in the middle of the night, you know. Which, what, you know hugging trees or something? Oh, no, God, no, no, whatever floats your boat, you know. <laughs> but, you know, this is the guy who's deciding who's nuts and who isn't. <laughs> so Frank's gone there and, and then he's decided, yeah, that, Everybody that was involved in the attack on him is going to get done. Yeah, this is how he's going to, you know, get his head together again. You know, he's on a proper revenge, proper term in Terminator mission. Yeah. So anyway, I'm in again. I'm in a blank block again in Franklin. This is about I think it must be 97 now. And not long after the, 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 the Bronson thing as well. So. And I'm looking out of the window and the block in Franklin has got two cages. So, you know, they let two people out at a time. One's walking around in one cage, one's walking around in the other cage. So this guy has got curly hair and he's got a black beard and that. Yeah, and he comes up and stands in front of the, the, the window. I mean, not, you know, because obviously there's a, a, a bit of a distance. And he's gone, all right, Mo. And I'm Who's this? I don't really know. He said, oh, don't you recognise me? I said, mate, he's gone, I'm Frank, Frank Burley. Frank. I went, whoa. I said, well, what? you look totally different, you know, because before that he was like, you know, clean shaven and all that. Now he's got this beard. But the beard was covering up all the all the scars wow. and stuff like that, yeah. So what he saw, you know, he's shouting down at the block and he's going, that Stevie Doyle's a grass. 
yeah, it's because of him they won't let me up on the wing and all this, blah, 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 yeah. I thought, you know what, well, I know Steve, Steve's sweet. Steve did go a bit nuts for a while, but, you know, he managed to sort... Steve, right, so get on this story with Steve, <laughs> yeah. Steve had shot a policewoman, yeah, had missed her heart by, oh like, a God. millimetre. Bloody hell. You know, this is a scouser, yeah, missed her heart by a millimetre, yeah. Thank God. And so he thought he was lucky, because he could have killed her, and he used to walk around, and every time he saw a bit of wood... He used to touch wood. He used to walk around with a match. And what, so when people you touch wood? Yeah, yeah, like luck, you know, for luck. Yeah. Touch wood for luck. So he used to, he used to put a matchstick in his ear and you'd see him walking, I'm serious, yeah, see him walking down the landing, touch the matchstick. Walking down the landing, touch the matchstick. One way to do it, isn't it? Who? <laughs> it's better than, yeah, touching, going around touching yeah, yeah, the kitchen no, table. Yeah, yeah, no, So, so I, I, so I go to Steve, I went, Steve, what's, what's, what's the girl with Frank there? Because I didn't know that story about... Um, um, full Sutton and he's gone well look this is what's happened and um, I said well he's pretty calling you grass down there and it's not just me saying it he's saying it in front of everybody so it's everybody's you know what I mean and uh, as it happens they let Frank onto the wing yeah? now really the screws they shouldn't have done that if they heard all this yeah so now right so this was Franklin before they built the new wings right so franklin before they built the new wings we had this ex um field it was huge you know what i mean you if you was at one end you couldn't see a person at the other end it was like literally about three rugby pitches yeah and then there was another one which was like asphalt uh, which had a toilet with you know perspex kind of windows that let us out in the evenings there. so they were building the new thingies and we were out in the perspex here so Steve's come out, sorry, Frank Burley's come out. I've said to hello to him, yeah, you know, I know him. It's got nothing to do with me, that issue, yeah. So I'm a neutral as far as this is <laughs> concerned, you know what I mean? So I said, all right, mate. And he's going, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then next thing you know, now everybody knows it's going to go off. So all the scousers have asked me and my my mate Lenny, like, you know, look, if it comes off, will you back us? We'll sort you out some money and lens, lens up for anything. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> so anyway, now we're all of us are walking around. And you know, like when everyone's having this one, but your eyes just there, you know what I mean? Now, one of them's gone into the toilets. The other one's gone into the toilets. Now we're expecting like, you know, fireworks and all that. Like, nothing, 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 yeah. A minute, minute and a half, two minutes later, we're like, what's going on? You, you know, you kill somebody in seconds, you know what it's like, you know what I mean? So uh, next thing you know, Ronnie O'Sullivan, the, the dad, yeah, he goes in. Dad of the snooker player. Yeah, yeah, only, only good things to say about Ronnie Senior, you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, he goes in and uh, he comes out and he's got his arms around my mother. Do you know what I mean? Now, I mean, bear in mind, you know, we're in that kind of thing, you know what I mean, or like, like, you know, dogs salivating, you know what I mean, over a fight, it's that kind of thing was going on, I'm like, what's going on there then, ah, that can't be right, somebody's saying he's a grass, and then, if, oh. so anyway, we go back on the wing, we're asking Steve Doyle, yeah, what happened, Steve, and uh, Steve's gone, well, I put it on him, I said, why'd you call me a grass, and he says, I didn't, I didn't say it, and I'm like, you know what I mean, mm. So next day, pretty much the next day, there was on D Wing. I'm on my way. D Wing. There was a firm of Geordies called the Adamses. I don't know if you've ever heard. If you John Sayers and all that, John knows all of them. He knows all of these stories and all. If you ever come across John, say hello to him for me. <laughs> we had Stephen Sayers on the yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. serious I, guy. Yeah. I, know, I know John. I know John quite well. So uh, anyway, so these Adamses. They'd got one of their workers had come in. It's something called, I think, Bruce Lee. It's like, literally, you got had that kind of mad name, yeah? So um, he's, he's come, and um, now they're feeling like a little bit even more than they were before. There were three brothers, now they've got one of them. And it's about tea time. We're just about to go for tea or something like that. And one of the black guys on the wing, I can't... His name for, uh, I've got him before, <laughs> but he's uh, he's gone to sit down in a chair, and this Bruce Lee guy is going, 
that chair's taken, mate. Yeah. Or however they say it in the Geordie Axe. <laughs> Why I like <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know. So anyway. But it's empty, the place is empty. So yeah, are you taking the piss or what? Yeah. And now so we're like, oh, what's going on? Yeah. So this guy, this black guy, he goes into the Adams cell and to say like what's going on, as he puts his head through the door, he only gets striped. Yeah. Now oh mate, it's gonna go off. Yeah, it's going to go off. So, do you want to, do you want to explain what striped is? They, they, he's got cut. I so he's, he literally, he's, he's put his head through the thing and, and the guys just went like that. So there's no warning, nothing like that. And he was just going like, what's going on? You know, and he's gone into a cell where there's like three or four of them. So he wasn't expecting anything. He's just like, let's talk, yeah? So anyway, there were about, there was a, 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 um, a firm of black guys there. As well, and, you know, you know proper, proper lads as well. And... Um, so tea times happened. Now the screws really, they should have locked us down because everybody knew what was going to happen. Mate, they opened us up. It just kicked off big style. The, the oldest of the Adamses, uh, uh, he just locked himself behind the door. The others, they just got stabbed and cut. And I mean, literally, the landing was full of blood. Yeah. And uh, the screws even just locked the landing, so legged it. I'm serious, yeah. And Frank Burley was there, and Frank's took the side of the black guys, yeah. And he's punched the screw. Now he's gone, yeah. So Frank's gone to from Franklin to uh, Wakefield uh, in the block down there, the reallocation. About six weeks later, Monster Mansion. Yeah, Monster Mansion, yeah. About six weeks later, um, there was a kind of a maddish fight, yeah, and which they said that I was involved, and I wasn't, yeah. They said that I fronted them, fronted the screws with a broken bottle, yeah, which is not my kind of thing at all, but they, they did it, you know, they said it, and they've shipped me off to um, um, Wakefield for reallocation. So as I'm going... Uh, the guy who's uh, in the van with me is Natty Patterson. He's a skinny, uh, cooly, uh, like Jamaican guy. When I say cooly, I mean like literally he's like kind of half Indian, half Jamaican. That's what they call them, coolies, yeah? Uh, he's a funny guy. I, I, you know, we used to get on really well with the cooking and all that. And, that, you know, proper take the piss out of each other, you know what I mean? I used to slaughter him. <laughs> <laughs> but he's skinny and tall and we used to get on really well. But we're supposed to be on opposite sides of this gang fight, yeah? So, and as, as we're on the way down, I'm going, fucking hell, mate. Hey, oh, Wakefield, mate, Monster Mansion. And Natty's, Natty Patterson, yeah, Natty's going, don't worry, Mo, I've got some gear up me ass. <laughs> <laughs> when we get there, we'll get on the wing, we'll get a little food bowl going. I'm going, Natty, mate, you don't want to go on the wing there. You know, every person you see there, you'll want to stab them, you know what I mean? You're better off if you stay down the block, you know what I mean? So anyway, we go down the block. They, they take us straight into the block, fucking Love Lane at Wakefield. And the block is Love actually... Love Lane? That, that's the, with the address. Uh, oh, is it? It is actually. It's <laughs> actually on Love Lane. Oh, how uh, lovely. Yeah. So, and it's, it's right in the middle of Wakefield as well. So, yeah. you, you know, the main kind of, um, uh, sorry, the main kind of uh, uh, thoroughfare through Wakefield, that's where it is. And the block is actually outside the wall of the prison. All right? So when you look out of the window, you see the wall of the prison. Get, yeah. That goes on to Love Lane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. so, 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 so we, we can only look at one side and then the, the streets on the other side, yeah. So I go there and that is kind of bristling and you want to see the screws there. They're like bulls and I'm talking that. And the women are like bigger than the men, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and then he's like, and I'm going, stop it, you fuck. And I'm just seeing those, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Those staircases with the yeah. you know the metal and I can just hear my head going ding ding ding. I'm like fucking leave it out, mate. You know what I mean? 
So, uh, and they're going, yeah, gangsters from Franklin, are you? Gangsters from Franklin. I'm going, no, nah, we ain't gangsters, you know what I mean? And uh, so anyway, uh, he's down there, Rab Harper, uh, Ian uh, Blink, <laughs> Ian McDonald. Ian Blink McDonald. Yeah. Shout McDonald. out to Ian Blink McDonald yeah, yeah. with the multiple episodes with him. Yeah. Check so him out on the he's, playlist. He's, yeah, he's called Ian Rab Harper. He's down the block down there. So the first thing we kind of do is you go there, you shout out of the window, who's here, get to know who's there. And Charlie's down there as well. And Charlie's got Charles his Bronson. own little suit. Yeah, sweet. I think Blink told me about Rab yeah. and, and Charlie. Yeah. 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 So, so this was around that time. Okay. So this, this is about 90, this is 97. I'll probably mm. get the date for you because I know when I got kicked out of mm. all those places, yeah. So, um... So I get chatting with Rab and I'm rattling off the gear and all of that kind of stuff going on. And, and uh, uh, Charlie's down there and Charlie's, I, I don't know if you know like the cells that he was in, what they actually look like. Have you ever yeah. seen them? No. Right. So what they've done is downstairs, they've turned three cells into two. And they've, they've used, the, uh, you know, the half of the one next to it as a shower. And, and what they've done is they put uh, bars in front of the door so they can, they can open the door and then the bars are like that and then they can put the food under without actually letting them out and without getting assaulted and accosted and all that kind of stuff yeah and then when charlie goes out on exercise he's got a special details about six screws they've got dogs and all that kind of stuff when he goes out on exercise so and where it is is when you walk around on the exercise yard yeah the, they're actually kind of like subterranean, so you've got kind of like about that much of the uh, of the window that, that you know, so you can squat down and talk to him, and he's down there. Yeah, mm. so <laughs> I'm walking. So you know, I've known him for years. You know, I mean, going back '86, I've known uh, Brunson. So this is now what '97, and uh, he's gone to me. What what happened? In, <laughs> what happened in Franklin with Frank Burley, Mo? And uh, so I tell him the story, I tell him the half the story, the, the half that I knew, you know. And well, this is what happened. He called him across, he's come up on the wing, they've gone out on the thing, and boom. And then Steve said that, that he's, he's um, when he asked him, he said, you, you never done it. So I said, all right, boom, whatever. So six weeks later, I get shipped to Long Lawton and reallocate, I go back to Lawton now. <clears throat> Lot and I'll go in and, 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 and they want to put me uh, on basic, oh, that's, you know, sort of all of this. They're going, listen, however you want to do it, whether you want to go down the block or whatever, yeah, you're still going to have to go on basic and all of that. you, you got to do it. I went, sorry, so uh, <coughs> go on basic. I get a letter from Frank Burley. He's going, Mo, what are you saying? What's this you saying about me? And I'm like, mate, and Frank was one of these guys, I told you, he was on a revenge mission anyway. He used to get ounces of heroin sent to other prisons to get people done. <sighs> Do you know what I mean? That's low. Do you know mm. what I mean? So I'm like, mate, you know. And, and I, so I, I wrote him a letter back. I said, listen, Frank, I said, if you remember that night, that, that evening, when you came out, I was one of the only people who actually spoke to you. Yeah, the other thing is, the story that I heard, I only heard one part of the story. I didn't hear your part because I didn't see you. It was the next day that fight happened and then you got shipped out. I said, when I told the story, I told that half of the story. So, you know what I mean? You can't say anything that I said this or whatever, you know what I mean? So I'm just bummed. So, yeah, so that was about the last time. I was a bit disappointed, really, you know what I mean? I thought, you know what? I could have got stabbed for that, innit? You know? Yeah. yeah. Was that the last time you saw Bronson? That was pretty much the last time I saw Bronson. Right. right. Yeah. Wow, Mo. You just told that story for yeah. 38 minutes, I think it was. Uh, right. You are an amazing yeah. storyteller. We've oh, not had someone as good <laughs> since Jamie Morgan yeah. Kane. Uh, okay. He told That's a 38 right. minute story yeah, that got yeah. 6 million plus views. Yeah, yeah. And you know, this one, I actually I actually cut bits off it because you shortened oh. it. Yeah. I did never shorten it. them. <laughs> no, 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 no. Never sh people say yeah. I'm going to cut a long story short. We're like, no. no. Yeah, you know we what? We want the long. Somebody, yeah, Ian, Ian, Ian did that. Ian did that, and I was saying, yeah. no, don't do that. 
But no, there, there was there was an aspect of that that was a little bit controversial. Okay. Yeah, we'll and I thought, you know what? Yeah, it's yeah. I, you know what I mean. He probably, he probably doesn't need it. You yeah, know, we don't we don't want any heat. Yeah, you know what I mean. Controversy. He probably heat. doesn't need it. I'll tell you. I'll tell you later on. You can. Yeah. Decide yourself, yeah. All right. So, so so for the viewers yeah. then, if you're sat here as gripped as I am by that one story, <laughs> his book is Mo's book is three hundred thousand words long. This is a mammoth operation we are undertaking. There is going to be a hopefully a series with Mo. We'll get his book out as a trilogy. And now we're going to go back. As I said at the very beginning, we're going to go back chronologically to the beginning of Mo's life. See how far we can take it before we've got to stop it for part two. But we're just going to let Mo run again. And um, if anything needs to be asked, we will, we will ask him. So the first thing is then Mo... What is your racial heritage? Right, yes. so <clears throat> I come from Kashmir. I was born in Kashmir, um, 13th of August, 1962. Actually, my dad didn't remember my date of birth, so he actually put a different one on the, on the passport. <laughs> but <laughs> they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't actually register him in those days. And, you know, he was busy. I, I, I mean, well... The reason why, you know, people come from Pakistan, there's no work there, mate. And Kashmir, even more so, because we're, like, occupied by India, occupied by Pakistan. So we've got even less of the less work, yeah? So my dad was going to places like, um, you know, brick making bricks, working on them furnaces in the, you know, it's like hell, you know what I mean? So anyway, he managed to borrow some money and got to, came to England and left my mum pregnant <clears throat> when he came. So when I met my dad... I was like about five years old, something like that, you know. And this is like proper Oedipal, you know. I hated him on sight. You know, we lived in a, a kind of adobe house, you know, in those days, yeah. And, um, you know, I had two brothers who were older than me. I was the third one. And so I had mum all to myself, you know what I mean? So mm. I was like, <laughs> I was still being breastfed when I was five so years old. you were boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. Wait until you hear about uh, later on, mate, you'll realise why. <laughs> <laughs> like my mum, yeah, this is why I'm short. My mum's shorter than me. My mum's about, you know, about four foot eleven, something like that. But and how tall are you? I'm about five four, you know. So she's, she was like proper, she's a, a force of nature, my mum, you know. God rest her soul. So, um, so in those days, uh, over there, there's no electricity, there's no running water. You know, if you want to cook a meal, yeah, you have to literally go to the nearest forest, break off some wood or whatever, collect the wood on the thing. You have to go to the nearest spring, get the water, you know, and it was hard work. So this is, my mum is by herself. My dad doesn't have any brothers. He's uh, an only boy and he's got four sisters to marry off. And he didn't know it at the time. That, that he he was actually owed a lot of land in that village and that his granddad, had, uh, when they kind of populated the village, had let people, you know, they, they went, right, this is our bit, this is our bit, this is our bit. And when new people came to the village, they went, yeah, I have that bit, you can build a house there, you can till this land and feed yourselves, you know what I mean? But as things happen, people get greedy and that, and then my dad didn't have any other backup. So anyway, he came to this country, he goes back, and uh, I get kicked out of my mum's bed. So, you know, then he's bribing me with little, you know, like the, the old sixpence type things, yeah. So, and by the, in, in that five years or so, he's, 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 he's proper grafted, <coughs> uh, saved some money, bought a two up, two down in Rochdale and got me and mum. Uh, and my youngest, my youngest sister was born. So nine months after my dad turned up. <laughs> I got a little, excuse me, got a little sister. What was, what was it like arriving? I, 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 I can't remember too much of it. Uh, I remember leaving, because uh, I was about six at the time, I remember leaving the village and there was a load of people had walked us to the one road that goes through the village and there was hardly any cars and stuff. And bear in mind, we're proper in the sticks here in those days. So we get on this uh, horse-drawn carriage, yeah. So we get on the horse-drawn carriage. I'm wearing shoes for the first time in my life, yeah. And we've got a suitcase or whatever. And then we uh, we go to Rawalpindi, which is about 
about 80 kilometers, something like that, from where we are. But it's a long way because it's all windy roads, you know what I mean? On the side of hills, and Kashmir is like all like hills and mountains, you know what I mean? So anyway, and then we get to Rawalpindi and we stay in this hotel, it's smelly and dirty and then we're in this little taxi and all, all I remember about the taxi was there's a hole on the floor and I could just see the road going past, wow. you know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. So we get onto the plane and it was one of those old 727s seven, or something, you know, like... Uh, uh, and uh, the guy who was there was a guy who was coming at the same time so he was kind of escorting my mom and he was calling his sister and all this and i remember we stopped a couple few times and one of the places we stopped was paris and he was saying to my mom he says oh look sister this is like the most beautiful city in Did the you world see the eiffel tower yeah yeah as, as we kind of was taking off you know i mean i remember oh. seeing like you know the, the the that thing but you know when when we got here i was oh, nakadao and it was january January 26th, 1969, and it was cold, <laughs> and it was snowing, and the snow, and, the, and and it was like, you know, there was not many cars in those days, you know, I feel like I'm talking about Victorian times, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it was the snow, and the, the, it was just like a, a blanket across the road, because there weren't that many cars. You know, and the street we were living on, those are the only car go down anyway. So it's like that all day, yeah? Mm. So I'm used to running around in my pyjamas and, 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 you know, barefoot. And I, and I run outside and uh, I can't work out why my feet are hurting. Yeah, I was, I've never seen snow. I don't even know what it is, yeah? Did it confuse you, seeing all the white... Snow on the yeah, floor. yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm, but you know, so I wanted to run in it. I'm thinking it's like sand or something like that, isn't it? You know. So I'll go running in, and then I come running back, and I'm crying. And my mum goes, "What's the matter? It's hurting." She goes, "You silly sausage." You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's snow. You know, I'm supposed to go out there with that. Uh, that's all. You know, if it's like burning yourself. You learn the hard way. You know? So we were living in the two up, two down. Me, mum. Uh, my sister and my dad, we were in one room, and the other room were um, some relatives of my dad. Um, one of them was my cousin, another one was like one of our kind of like, you know, a bit more distant relative. One of them was my dad's cousin. Yeah, he was like about, I don't know, 18, 19 at the time, I'm about six, yeah. So he's kind of playing with me at that time. And this is, you know, it gets a bit dark at that time. I didn't know what was going on. Oh I'm only a kid, you know what I mean? And uh, and, and you, uh, to be truthful, a lot of that that period of my life, I can't remember. At home, I can't remember. I can remember going to the school. I, can't re I can remember going out and do... But at home... I can't remember, about two years, I can't remember, you know what I mean? Blocked it out. Yeah, and, and the guy was kind of, you know, wrestling with me, grooming me and stuff like that. I didn't know what was going on. And then he was like, you know, actually abusing me. Then he was like, he was, you know, then we'd moved from one house to another house. And then, because we had, we all, we were sharing a, a bedroom. So by this stage, my two older brothers had come. Uh, I've got another younger brother uh, born in this country and uh, another one younger than him born in this country. So um, so my eldest brother, he's got a room by himself because he was 14 when he came. But he's probably, right, he was a rocket scientist. My brother, I swear to God, yeah, he's a rocket scientist, retired now. He comes to this country 14, he did a, um, uh, um, seven O-levels. Um... Uh, he did six months English teaching centre, went to school, high school, yeah. In 18 months, he did seven O-levels, one of them, chemistry, just through a book, yeah. He did three A-levels, went to Nottingham University, did uh, a degree in electronic engineering, had been working for British Aerospace all his life, designing guidance systems on missiles. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> this, yeah. So when I say the rockets, I, I mean it literally. It yeah. Literally. So, uh, so, so, so we're in this this next house. This next house is bigger. My eldest brother's got his own room, and we've got all this room, and this we're sharing with this guy, and he's creeping into my bed every oh. night, and he's you know he's just like sticking his fucking bits between my legs, and you know what I mean, pretty much just wanking himself off in there. You know what I mean. 
and I, uh, you know, my my behavior, no. So even before that, you know, something happened. I, I don't know what had happened yet, and I I I got constipated to such a degree I couldn't go to the toilet <gasps> for six mm. days. Yeah, so my mom took me to the doctor. Yeah, and the doctor gave her these little pills to stick on me little bum. Yeah. A pessary. Yeah, I, I don't called. know what it was. Yeah. yeah, but it made me it made me go. Mm. Yeah, but any enema. Mm. Yeah, no, no, it was tiny little pills, but it, so it must yeah, be they, breaking your stuff down, isn't it? Breaking I your shit down. Yeah, but yeah. So, but yeah. So anyway, so 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 this is what he was doing was like he's creeping his in bed, doing that at night, and going back into his own bed, and he'd have this shirt that he used to, you know, come in and he'd just wedge it down the side of my bed. Yeah, mm. my bed was up against the wall, and you know, I'm just sleeping through it or pretending not to, you know, because I, I don't know what's going on. But at some stage, I realized that what he's doing is wrong, yeah? And then one night, it was like, he, that, that one, probably the last time he came, came in and, think, and he, he penetrated me, and then something in my head just went bang, and then I just started kicking, yeah? And I just kicked him out, yeah? And I just went, you know what I mean? So, and by this time, about 11 or something like that, you know what I mean? And but my behavior has just gone like that. I don't know. I don't know. I even when I look back now, I can't tell you what I thought or what. But I just I I felt like I had to be hard. You know, I wanted to give that impression that I was hard, but I was only little. You know what I mean? And this is before everybody else had a growth spurt and all that. You know, and I'm still little. So yeah. So I don't I don't know how. You know, I'm wearing. Um, like uh, Wrangler jackets, I'm wearing Doc Martin boots, I'm smoking, you know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> I go to school I, in the morning, I, um, there was a shop just around the corner and she used to serve as 10 number 6, pack a box of matches. So by the age of 11, I'm buying my own fags every day. You know, mum, the, the pocket money she used to give me, I won't catch the bus and that, you know what I mean? That's what we, that's what we used to do. And then I started thieving, and then you know the the mates that the the group of friends that I had at that time, you know they were like normal guys, you know what I mean. So um, one of them was from a you know large Catholic Irish family, uh, the Doolins, you know what I mean. So we lived in West Street in Rochdale. Uh, so they're like the three of us, like three musketeer type things. So we had one who was older than us, Ted. Ted's up in Scotland now, in Mohammed Akil. He's got a spec savers, you know, he's doing really well for himself. Uh, Johnny Doolin, who was like my age, you know what I mean? I fancied his sisters and all that, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I used to run away from home and stay at John's. He was just live around the corner. So that was like, you know, my kind of teen. But, you know, everywhere we went, I was the one who did the bad thing or did the worst bad thing, you know what I mean? I did the nuttiest thing, and you know, suddenly I'm the so I'm bunking off school now. But and all right, so going back to kind of where I, when I was about twelve, yeah, um, the school I was a, a middle school, um, and they gave me a letter, and my English was quite good. I didn't know at the time, anyway. Uh, but they gave me a letter and said give it to your parents and and, the, and I opened it along because I thought I'm in trouble you know what I mean because now I'm smoking I think I'm a bad kid you know what I mean mm. so I've uh, opened this letter and it says that they recommended that I should go to Littleborough Grammar School and I thought oh, I don't want to go to Littleborough Grammar so I've ripped the letter up and stuck it down the uh, down the, gu- the gutter yeah the drain because uh, my brother was at Green Hill which was like the, the, the roughest school in town but I wanted to be you know, in the school where my brother was. So, and by the time I got to a Green Hill, um, now I'm, I'm, I'm bunking, you know, while we're whacking it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And in those days, you could go all around Greater Manchester for two pence on the bus. And this was, that, that, that's, you know, I used to go in in the morning, uh, get my mark, uh, uh, get my mark, go to assembly, and on the way back, I'd jump out the window and, and, and I'd be gone. Uh, I would go around Rochdale or around Manchester or whatever. And, um, and 
so and, and but then you know my mum she's like proper strict as well do you know what I mean so she found out that I was smoking she realized I wasn't going to stop so she didn't you know do my head in about it so um but I couldn't explain how I was um absent so what I used to do every you know few weeks I'd uh, volunteer to take the register up to the form <laughs> office, chip into the toilets along the way, have a little red pen and put little L's in all, all the zeros. Yeah, so all the ones where I was absent, they were all late. So my mum's going, how come you're late 53 times this term, you know what I mean? I literally haven't been, you know what I mean? So, um, so, and you know, I was quite, I was quite bright and they were expecting kind of, you know, if my eldest brother's a rocket scientist and he's been educated, you know, while he's herding goats in Kashmir, I should be fucking a brain surgeon or something <laughs> like that, you know what I mean? But I had this whole kind of like, I just angry, uh, hated myself. Um, I just couldn't see uh, um, what I would ever do. Um, I remember talking to my little brother one time and, um, you know, and I'm not talking a long time ago. Um, and, and I was saying that, you know, there was a time in my life when I used to think that being in care would be a, like, a good option. That was like what I was looking forward to. I thought, you know, well, get out of this house and go, go to care. I didn't know what being in care was like, but I knew lads who was, you know, in there. So I was getting in trouble with the police. So the only time, because my dad used to work two shifts, you know, I'd see him as I was going in the house, he was coming out, or I was, uh, you know, coming out, he was coming in. So, and the only time I walked with my dad is when he picked me up from the police station at kind of three, four o'clock in the morning, you know what I mean? I've had another row, I've ran, I've gone for three days, you know, when I'm 13, 14, 15, and that's, that's how... Yeah, uh, that's how I, uh, I got to kind of 15, yeah. And so it was just getting worse and worse. So, but they didn't know. They didn't know what it was. No, none of my family have kind of gone through this thing. None of them kind of, it's only recently that I've started talking about it, that, that, that they go, well, how come, why, why did you do all that? Why, you know, we can't understand. So I get to 15 and <laughs> it's Christmas 77, yeah, and I've got my mock exams coming up soon, yeah, and I'm shitting it because I know I'm going to fail everything. It's all going to come on top, you know, all this blagging that I've been doing for years, yeah. So um, my mum says, do you want to go to Kashmir for a three-week holiday? You were like, yes. Went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So my elder, bro uh, elder brother than me, Azzy, as he, well, there's two of us really because he was, he left home, he set up with a, an Irish girl, Barbara, and, you know, I was the only one in the family who knew about this. This was quite kind of like, it was mad because, you know, we, I don't know if you know about the Asian community, how they are and, you know, how many people you know, uh, um, you know, how we live and all that. But you expect it to kind of do what your parents tell you. You know, you go through the whole Muslim, the, the, the mosque thing, yeah. And, you know, when I was... Uh, the, the, the first street that we lived on, Lord Sherry Street, that two up, two down, the first house was called the Golden Mosque. That was the biggest mosque in Rochdale, yeah. So my mum used to send me there before school every morning. So by the time I'm seven, I've read the Quran from cover to cover in Arabic, yeah, I don't even know English at this time, yeah, <laughs> wow. so I can read it in Arabic, yeah, so now, so we go, we have to do that one there, um, and then when we moved uh, um, uh, to the next location, which was a little bit, so then uh, by this stage I was bunking off that as well, and the guy who was abusing me, he'd given me this kind of a, uh, like a nickname, you know, Qaim Deen, which means like, you know, somebody who's attained a religion, you know, you, you, yeah, you, you're on the right religion. And I'm thinking, and in, in me, it was, it was relating to that. So I was like hating it. And so I was hating the religion and that, you know, it's me, it was, uh, it was that, you know what I mean? So, and my brother, um, 
he was he's four years older than me. Uh, Razi, he's, he's dead as well now, God rest his soul. He's on last year he died. He went to Kashmir, had a stroke. And um, mm. and me and him, we were kind of really quite close, you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, my eldest brother is six years older, so he's in a, in a different kind of a thing. So um, as he um, was going out, we were, so we used to go to uh, uh, youth clubs in those days, yeah? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and you know, we, we, we chat to the girls there and mm. play football and ten and table tennis, do what all of that <laughs> kind of stuff. And I was a quite an active kid. You know, I, I used I was in the air cadets, um uh in Rochdale. We'd have flown planes with them, you know what I mean? And um and my brother, he was uh studying at Oldham Tech College. So during the day he was there, he said to me can you uh, go to the flat and, you know, when the furniture and stuff like that comes, um, uh, do that? And I said, yes, all right. So we do that. Uh, the local shops around there, we're robbing them. We've got a place to chip during the day now. <laughs> he set up with the barber there. And when he left our house, that was a big thing because nobody saw it coming. Right. So my mum and dad are like, oh, my God, what's happened here? You know? What are people going to think? Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, as he says to me, uh, when I told him that uh, I'm going to Kashmir for a three-week holiday, yeah, as he's gone, don't go. I went, why? He's gone, Mo, you won't come back. What? I said, well, they won't do that to me. Yeah, he knew, mate. Uh, I said, they won't do that to me. He says, I'm, I'm telling you, if you want my advice, don't go. But I was thinking more about, A, I want to leave the country, B, I don't want to do uh, my mock exams, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So um, uh, one of the guys who used to live with us at that first house in Rochdale, yeah, he's uh, my escort going back to Kashmir. So now I'm 15. Uh, it was about nine, ten years now since... I left, <clears throat> I can't remember anything about what it was like. Um, I've got a skateboard and stuff, stuff like that. Typical teenager. Yeah, yeah I've got, yeah. I've got some, yeah, but in our area, nobody had a skateboard. I had two because I was a right little thief. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we go uh, on the way, and this is in 19, January 1970. Oh, wow. Mm. So we're in this plane uh, going to Kashmir. The guy who's with me, I'm trying to make out I don't smoke, but I'm chipping off to the back every 10 minutes, having a fag. So you could smoke on planes back then? No, yeah, of course oh, you could. And uh, there's uh, these Iranian students. And this is around, this is just before the Islamic Revolution in Iran. So these lads are sitting at the back there and uh, they're drinking whiskey and soda. <laughs> and they're going, do you want a whiskey and soda? I go, no, it'll get on me. And then next time I go there, do you want a whiskey and soda? I say, yeah, go on then. Bang, knock that one back. Next one, <laughs> bang, knock that one back. <laughs> so, but before we went, yeah, I had to have the, 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 the jabs and stuff like that to go. And because my mum knew what she was doing, she'd got the clothes and stuff like that for me. So for the first time, in my life, in 1978, I had a pair of uh, platform heels and, <laughs> you know, them uh, bell-bottom trousers and stuff like that. I've got wow. a dodgy photo of me wearing that stuff, yeah. So uh, we're going to um, Pakistan uh, Islamabad Airport. Uh, by this time, I'm, you know, half cut. But because you're in a pressurised uh, hull, you don't realise it. You mm. think you're all right. So as soon as the door opened and I smelled the air and, I, and, and it was those stairs going down, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> just about <laughs> caught myself. And go out into the street in Pakistan, suddenly after living in this environment for 10 years, and mate, you're like, what is this? You know, it's just dust and it wasn't heat so much because it was January, but then you've got all the beggars there with all the deformities and I'm like, oh, and the guy who's with me, Mo, don't do that, mate. They'll follow you all the way to Kotli, you know, where we're going. So I go, um, he drops me off at my auntie's. He goes to do his own things, yeah. Three weeks later, no letter. 
no phone, what's going on? Yeah. I go through my suitcase, passports there, ticket, one way single. <laughs> One way single, mate. I went, oh, mate. And my skateboard, yeah. There's not even a pass to do the skateboard. It's all like, you know, it's, there's no pass. So you there. didn't check the ticket before you left? No, I, I didn't give me the ticket. The, I had an escort, the, the chaperone, Gave the guy the was ticket. with me. He was, yeah, he had the ticket. I, I was re oh yeah, I was reading the book uh, The Exorcist on the way there. Oh, wow. <laughs> so imagine this one, yeah. So now I go there and they they all believe in all this, you know, this these things and demons and you know stuff getting into people and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And I actually uh, I went to this village where my grandmother's from, and they said that this woman had this thing, yeah, and this guy he knew how to get it out of her. So I'm with this guy now, and I bear in mind, I've read The Exorcist, yeah? So I'm sitting with him, and she's lying on the bed, and she's got this kind of guttural, ah, I'll do this, ah, I'll do this, yeah? And he's going, oh, if you don't leave her, I'm going to stab you, and I'll do this and that, yeah, etc. And they're going through all of this, and I'm like, proper, I'm like, mate, what, what, what if it's all real, do you know what I mean? And then... Um, the, the the place where we were, it was on the side of a hill. So there, like, like front yard is like the roof of the barn where the animals are kept. So he gets um, uh, a, a water pitcher, yeah, puts it on the corner of that roof, and he's come back and he says, "I want to know, yeah, when you leave this woman, leave her now, yeah. When you leave her, I want you to knock that pitcher over and." I, I'm like, that's the picture, you know. <laughs> but they must have, I, you know, it didn't fall. It didn't fall, yeah. Right. But I'm thinking, may, maybe, you know, maybe they, it, I, I can't say, but you know, that's what he'd done. So anyway, I'm there for, oh God, eight months. I see some rest of my family, like in other parts of Pakistan and stuff like that. And then my mum... Uh, our Azzy, my sister Raz, and my youngest brother, um, our Ishvak, they turned up. How did you survive for the eight months? Well, I was, I was staying at my auntie's. Oh, okay. My dad had a building over there, and the rent that they were getting for the building, I was getting a, you know, 20 rupees a week, which mm. was a couple of quid or whatever. But it was a lot of money. I mean, you know, 20 rupees, and uh, a packet of fags cost less than a rupee. <laughs> so mm. you can imagine, you know, you know I, I, it was great. So uh, once you get used to the fact that, you know, it's not 5,000 miles away, it's actually like 500 years back in time. <laughs> They've got no electricity still. Yeah, there's no um, TVs. The odd kind of person's got a TV, the odd kind of person's got a, a phone. So mm. that's the environment. So I've just put myself into that environment. Um, I've seen, you know, they're like peasant farms. So everybody's doing their own little thing. It's just about enough to get them by. But, you know, everybody wants to send somebody abroad so that they can send money back and that they can build a house and stuff like that. So on my 16th birthday... 13th of August, my mum and, and the rest of my family, they land in Islamabad airport. I'm staying, I've gone down to see my uncle, my mum's eldest brother. and Because my mum's, uh, uh, it was a love marriage between my mum and my dad and her eldest brother was the one that married them. Yeah, because he officiated uh, at it, yeah. So I was, and he was a, he was a doctor, yeah. He'd, he'd got a stiff girl and he was, you know, uh, doing doctoring there yeah but he, you know he, he had quite a lot of status and you know he was a very stern kind of man about 22 stone you know what i mean big red face on he's a big guy you know and then it was the first time i see him and i he didn't even look at me and i thought that's a bit weird you know mm. he's my uncle you know and uh, he just walked past me and i had quite long hair at the time Next thing I know, a barber's turned up from nowhere, flung me on the bed, and they chopped me fucking <laughs> hair off, you know what I mean? And I was literally almost in tears. I thought, wow, I can't say nothing, you know what I mean? So anyway, I go back from that, and that um, it's night. Well, not night, it's kind of like morning, about 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, 
and it's a really clear night. I can remember it to this day, August, and the corn is like really, really tall. It grows to about eight, ten foot, and you're walking through these little paths, you know, through the fields, and I get to my, and it's like a full moon, and I get to my auntie's house where I'm staying, and I don't know my mum's coming. I see... I'm looking for a bed to lie in, mm. and then I see my little brother. Oh. Um, mm. And now I can't wait till he wakes <laughs> up, you know what I mean? Then they wake up, because he was five at the time, and then I find out he's, uh, who's come, and he's gone, oh, you know, as he's come. And I couldn't believe as he'd come, because Barbara was gorgeous, you know, I thought mm. him and Barbara was going to be like a problem, but they just got into his head, and you know what I mean? Took him over there, and married him off. They wouldn't let me back at that time. They're saying, right, unless you get married, we're not going to send you back. Yeah, because wow. they think that marriage is that, well, well, hey, they thought sending me to Kashmir was the answer to me <laughs> thieving. Yeah, and then getting married would be the answer to me, all the rest of it, which, anyway, my brother, as he, God rest his soul, he's, uh, he, he, he taught my mum out of it. And then come December 78, we came back to uh, England and but this time they'd all moved from Rochdale to Luton mm. so now oh, I, I've got no mates yeah and while I'm there they've all so right the area that we're from in Kashmir most of them people they live in the Luton area so we were like you know and kind of an outpost and they were saying well look you know anytime there's a wedding or a funeral we have to kind of go up there and you know it's easy for you guys if you come here there's loads of us but there's only one of you so that's what my dad decided so when I come back it was like well new chapter and all of that kind of stuff yeah right. so what was Luton like for you then Luton back then so Luton was weird Luton was because I, cause what, I what year are we on now so we're on beginning of 78 now okay so now I'm it was like 16. Punk rock, wasn't it? Was out around then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 76. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in. Um, I've got no qualifications at all. Yeah, I haven't finished school. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? But I've got this, all this unresolved trauma that still kind of wants to burst out, but doesn't know how. And so I do a bit of work. Then I started college, I started a course, which was, if I passed it with a credit, it was like four all levels. There's a business studies back in general, and then a back national to get A levels. So, and, but at that time, I saw my dad speaking at a meeting of the JKLF. Now, this is how I get into the, the political thing, yeah? So, and I thought, you know what, well, this is the first time I've ever seen him like in this role where he's standing up and everybody's looking at him and, you know, hearing what he's saying. And I couldn't really understand that much, but, you know, I could take some of it in. So, and then Arazi, he was into the politics quite a bit. And because I, I said to him, I said, I, I you know, it was these were uh, the 80s, the time of Sabra and Shatila, the uh, camps in Beirut where the... Um, um, I think the Israelis and the, the I think it was the the South Lebanese. I can't remember. It was one of the factions in Lebanon as well. They'd attack these camps and just kill these people, and um, you know they wanted to get rid of them. They wanted to get rid of the Palestinians out of Beirut, basically. So I said to Azzi, I said, well, you know what, I'd like to go down there and help them, you know, because you know when you can't see a way forward, then you're always looking for something to kind of prove your life, you know, go on a life or death mission. And maybe that, that, that you know, if you live, yeah. then there's a purpose to your life, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, 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 when I look back, I think maybe that is something like that. So, uh, and as he's gone to me, well, Kashmir is like that. So, well, what do you mean? And he's gone, well, well Kashmir was never a, a, a part of the British Empire. He says, uh, when the British fought the Sikhs, in the 1840s, as a, it's not even the British, it was the East India Company, uh, as it was going up through India, um, it had two wars with the Sikhs, and the Sikhs had conquered Kashmir, so it got Kashmir as part of the kind of a dowry thing, and the, one of the guys who helped them defeat the Sikhs, he bought Kashmir off the uh, East India Company, 
And what's happened is he's realized that, you know, they all want to go to Kashmir uh, in the holidays, because uh, in the summer, because it's nice and cool in the mountains and lakes and all of that. So he's uh, had a blanket van saying you can't, outsiders can't buy land in Kashmir. So then they decided to make hotels and houses on boats, which are the houseboats, the famous houseboats in Kashmir. So as he's going to me, oh, look, this has happened. And then partition happened in 1947. And then a partition, we weren't part of India, we weren't part of Pakistan. Yeah, but Pakistan wanted Kashmir, so they've thrown some of their own people pretending to be uh, civilians to say, right, we're Kashmiris, we want Kashmir with Pakistan. Uh, and the Maharaja, who was uh, Hindu, has asked Nehru, said, look, you know, help me. He's going, well, I'll help you, yeah, but if you accede to India, and the majority of the population of Kashmir is Muslim, it's about 80% Muslim, something like that. So... Um, under those conditions, the Indian army came, the Pakistani army, who probably for the first time in recorded history, whose uh, the heads of both armies were British, the field marshals of both armies were British, because this was still going through partition. And uh, so, and then Mountbatten said, well, look, you know, the Kashmiris should decide, and then... Nehru took the case to the United Nations and said, yes, you know, we'll let them have a referendum. And then they never held the referendum. And this is the kind of the root cause of the Kashmiri issue. And um, what happened was there was one of the guys who was the found, one of the founders of the Kashmiri Freedom Movement, a guy called Makbul Bhatt, who was under a death sentence in, in India. You know, he'd been uh, um, active in the 60s, you know. Um, they'd got him uh, for murder and stuff like that. You know, had shootouts with the police and the army and stuff like that. He'd escaped from prison there, come to Pakistan, then gone back again himself. He was under a death penalty when he went back. So this guy's proper serious, you know what I mean? It's like mm. Che Guevara to us, you know what I mean? So anyway, he's gone back and then he's got captured again and then... He's been on death row for 12 years and stuff like that. So this is, the, you know, when, when I looked at Kashmir, I'm looking at it through the eyes of a kid that's grown up in the West, you know, believes in Greenpeace and stuff like that, mm. do you know what I mean? Yeah. So then, I, you know, I did, I did my bit of college, did a bit more the Kashmiri thing, had more mates from college mates, going out. I was always, you know, having a drink, having a smoke, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, I fell out with uh, one of my lecturers who was the head of the course when I was doing the Beck National, which would have been equivalent to A-levels. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to get to a position where I can kind of get a good certificate, something to give me a, you know, a, a platform for the future. So... Um, Anyway, I, and then in those days you could do um, a part-time course A-levels uh, as long as you did less than, I think, 16 hours or something like that. So I did that. I did government and politics and economics. I passed the government and politics, a one-year part-time course A-level, got a C in that, and that got me to Leicester Poly, and uh, that was when the thing that happened that got me into the prison. That's what happened then, right? Wow. wow. So, yeah. So, so you you're want... doing well. Eh? You're doing well, you've got your qualifications, and then what happens? Right, so so I've got my A-level, so I'm going into um, uh, Leicester Poly to do HND in business studies, yeah? yeah? So which should be enough to get me through life in a you know reasonable kind of a manner. But, you know, I've still got this unresolved thing and it's coming out, you know, I'm dressing up all kind of um, mad clothes and, you know, new romantic and stuff Ooh. like that. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. I was like Adamant and, you know, you can name it. I was like all of that, you know what I mean? And, you know, this was the thing that, you know, I'd walked down the street in Luton, yeah, and I stuck out like a... I saw you were the some, boy. Yeah, these. <laughs> I I got I got I got. Um, what's your What's your Adamant impression? 
No. Well, no, I mean, I mean, you know, the the the, the whole. Can right, so, do you remember, so do you remember the lyrics? Um, Have you got them? Unplug the jukebox. <laughs> oh, all a favor. Oh, that music's lost its taste. Find another, another flavor. And music. I knew all of that. <laughs> yeah. I was into all of that. Yeah, I into to such an extent. I used to walk around at the Cape. What? Yeah, I, I, I swear to God, yeah. I had a key. Yeah. I used to have these, like, you know, like, party, you, you know, like, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. I, was, oh, my God, I swear to God, yeah. I used to get uh, 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 berated, yeah. I mean, that takes some doing to walk down the street and somebody going, you're weird, you know. I mean, well, I must be doing something right, yeah. You ain't it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so by this stage, so I've, so I've got these kind of, you know, dual life going on. And we're going on marches and demonstrations for the Kashmiri cause thing. And, and then uh, this guy, um, um, Sarat Iqbal, who was um, living in Lechworth, had moved to Luton, was staying in a house uh, that my dad owned on the same road. And he, I was so bad. So I'm living in, sorry, I'm living in Leicester now. I've started the course there. He comes up, says, oh, will you come to... Birmingham, I want to introduce you to a few people. And I said, yeah, I'll come. And then something else happened and it didn't. For a party? I don't know. I thought, yeah, you know, it could have been anything. To me, yeah, say hello, yeah, sit down, smoke a few joints, have a few drinks, you know, that kind of stuff. Maybe, I don't know. So, (laughs) you know, it's just one of them ones, isn't it? So, uh, and then the next time we come, it's the same thing. So, uh, Actually, no, this was, uh, he came with another guy. And this guy I knew from the organiser from the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front as well. But he was from Birmingham. So the pair of them have turned up on a Sunday night. And usually I'm out Sunday, I'm out Saturday, I'm out Friday. And um, they've turned up and come in. Oh, all right, guys, what do you want? Come on, sit down, have a cup of tea, have a chat. And he's going, oh, I want you to, he said, oh, I said, come down next week, come down to Birmingham, I want to introduce you to a few people. Said, oh, yeah, uh, whatever. And he's asked to borrow a key of my house, my Yale house key. And I used to use that to nick my brother's Ford Capri, yeah, and <laughs> yeah, and he used to work, you know. Did it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, he'd just jiggle it and, you know, bump, and then I used to drive around in it. So <laughs> he's obviously seen me do that, and I thought, oh, that's the only thing I can think of that he would want that key for. And uh, he didn't realise it's not the key, it's the person who's jiggling it, do you know what I mean? So and anyway, so, um, yeah, I, so I go the next Thursday, I get um, a, 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 a coach, I go on the coach, to Bowring in Birmingham. And... Bear in mind, you know, I don't get on really well with the lads in the hall of residence where I'm living. Um, get on great with everybody. Uh, where I'm organising this football um, thing between one hall of residence and another. I'm staying in Lawrence Kershaw Hall of Residence. So we've got this team and, you know, we used to go and, you know, Leicester Nick outside this Mandela Park. We used to practice there, and I, used to, I never thought, you know, about what them people are like behind in those, you know, behind those bars. So, uh, and and we were supposed to play a game that Sunday. So I left, and I said to the guys, "said Listen, I'm going to Birmingham. Uh, if I'm not back today, I'll be back tomorrow." <laughs> yeah, because I'm not expecting anything. So anyway, I get there, and uh, I, I, he comes, picks me up from the ball ring, he's in a hired car, there's some other guys in there, and, you know, I thought, well, maybe these are the kind of guys he wants to introduce me, I was was getting the car, so now we're driving around some suburbs of Birmingham, we're going somewhere, and I don't know Birmingham, so it could be anywhere. So he says, and that's when the alarm bell started to ring, he says, "Uh, I want you to look after somebody for a while. Yeah? I went... What do you mean? I've got to look after someone. What do you mean? And he's gone, I'll brief you when we get there. And now I'm like, what? So anyway, we walk into this house. It's newly bought. 
there's no, like you know there's no furniture all of that kind of thing there's you know four or five lads there all kind of older than me i'm what, about 21 at the, at the time uh, they've got guns yeah and now he's dropping this plot on me yeah saying that this guy that mcgobert the one who escaped from and they got captured again was doing uh, on the death penalty they're about to carry the death penalty out Right, and we've got to do something. I said, "Well, what, what, yeah, what do you think you could do, yeah, to stop that?" He said, "Well, we're going to kidnap the high commissioner at the consular, at the Indian consular in Birmingham, and we're going to hold him hostage, yeah." And and so I'm going, "Whoa, <laughs> whoa, I can't do this." I said, "Look," I said, "Now I'm like, you know, a million excuses at once, yeah." I went, no, for a start, yeah. I said, I've got to be in court. Uh, look, magistrate's Monday. And I had a breathalyzer charge, yeah. I said, I've got, I've got to be in court on Monday. Uh, if I'm not there, it's going to be on top. You know what I mean? Do you get somebody else? No, no, no. He says, I'll, I'll stay here, yeah, uh, until Sunday and I'll get somebody else. And, uh, oh, mate, I'm stuck, you know what I mean? I'm stuck. I can't, you know, because it's like... Now, it's because my dad's the president of the organization there, and even though we can't be seen to be that organization, everybody knows it is, yeah? So, and he gives me this uh, kind of ransom note, yeah, that they want these three guys out. Uh, one of them is Macbul Bart, another one's called Hamid uh, Bart, another one's called Riaz Da, yeah? Um, and he wants a million pound as well. Yeah, if, uh, you might you might as well add a few more. <laughs> <laughs> might as well add a few more while you're at it, you know what I mean? A million pounds as well. And he's asked the, the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front to be the negotiators, right? This is what and I'm like, mate. And I'm 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 just I'm just flabbergasted, you know, and I I I, I can't think of a way out. Uh, I I realise I'm properly stuck. Mm. And now I'm thinking, what's the kind of least I can do and, and, and slip away um, without causing too much damage to anybody else and myself, do you know what I mean? So he asked me to write, so I write the fair copy of this, the, this ransom note. They go out to get this uh, high commission. So it's actually happening now, yeah? Mm. So this is the 2nd of February 1984. They go out, they come back about an hour, hour, <clears throat> hour and a half later, he's not there. Yeah, he, lucky for him, he's on a meeting down in London. So they go, I'm going, is that it? I, no, no, we're going to go back tomorrow, we're going to get him tomorrow. So the next, so the, now the guy who's in there with me, so right, there's two of us who are in this role of the guards, yeah, the other guy, a guy called Kayum Raja, he's come over from um, Paris, France, yeah, and his passport's run out as well, so I think he didn't actually know what was going on, yeah. They've roped him in because uh, he's from France. They've roped me in because I'm recently in Leicester. If I'm missing in Leicester, people will think I'm in Luton, and the Luton people think I'm in Leicester. So this is what this guy's thought, and this guy's supposed to be a mate. Yeah, so the next day they come back. They've got somebody. They've got this guy. They, he's got wraparound sunglasses with tape on the inside. Uh, they've done his hand hands up. Uh, they've whacked him over the head. You know when they've nabbed him off the street. Um, and he's like, you know, middle-aged, he's nondescript, you know what I mean? Thickly set, and he's just confused and bewildered me. And they, 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 as they're walking past, uh, West, <clears throat> so this house, um, it's got kind of three bedrooms. There's one in the middle, there's one in the back, and there's one in the front. Uh, we're in the middle one. Uh, out the front, there's a main road. I really found out later on, it's Allen Rock Road. Uh, the house is 370 Allen Rock Road. And um, so you go up the stairs, you're going through the, the, the landing, and as they're walking past me, 
I asked Masur, that guy, I said, who is it? Who have you got? He's gone, uh, we've got the assistant high commissioner. The high commissioner was still there, had to do it, had to get him. So got the assistant high commissioner. So I'm, you know, like, like, hey, I know we're not getting anybody. We're not getting anybody released. We're getting nothing. Yeah, I'm just on a hiding to nothing. Yeah, I'm just going to try and do as little as possible. So anyway, uh, they have took him into the room. They've had a few goals at him, called him Indian bastard, this one, that one, yeah. And as they go in, as I go in there, I see he's bleeding from his head and stuff like that. One of the guys there, I've gone, listen, I want you to get some bandages. I want you to get some Sablon antiseptic cream, stuff like that, yeah. No, no, no. Because now they're all like paranoid, yeah. And I said, look, you know, you, you fucking trap me in here. You're going to have to start, you know what I mean? I'm not going to sit here with a guy bleeding to death in front of me, you know what I mean? So anyway, uh, about 45 minutes later, he's come back with some antiseptic cream. He's come back with some bandages. I've untied him. We've gone to the bath, washed his head, put some bandages on him. Because I'm thinking, Sean, I'm thinking, I'm gone, mate. Uh, this is on a Friday now, 3rd of um, uh, February. I thought Sunday 5th, I'm gone. I'm going to say as little as possible so it doesn't get on my voice. And, um, you know, the, the, my mate, the Kayum, the other guy, you know, he's having a good chat with him in Urdu and stuff like that. And, you know, my Urdu wasn't that clever anyway. So I'm waiting for my relief now on the Sunday. So, you know, we're doing the watch, you know, uh, the two of us. So what's happened is on the Friday night, he's dropped the diplomat with us, Mr. Martra, Ravindra Martra, he was called, Ravindra Harishwar Martra. He's dropped him with us. He's gone down to London, uh, the, um, where the Reuters press agency, opposite that is um, obviously a phone box, and he's left the ransom note and uh, the, you know, his keys and his diplomatic ID to say, right, we've got him. And phoned Reuters and said, look, go there and, you know, you'll find this, that and the other. So anyway, they do that. So the Friday night gone, now Saturday, yeah. And bear in mind, I don't know we're on Alam Rock Road. And the reason why I say that, Alam Rock Road used to be our, the headquarters of the JKLF was at 348 Alam Rock Road. And we're at 370 Alam Rock Road. So literally 11 doors away from what used to be the headquarters of the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front. So that's what JKL means, real. Ah. So, so the next day, all I can hear is e on e on e on e on police cars, yeah. And I, shit, I'm thinking, what, what are the police doing here, yeah? And now I'm thinking about the Iranian embassy siege, yeah, um, where the SAS have come in through the windows. <laughs> all, all we've got is like these replica guns that they've given us because they've took the tools with them, you know. So Kayum's having a chat with this guy and I'm trying to say as little as possible, you know, untied him. In the end, he ain't going to go nowhere. So I'm waiting till uh, Sunday. Now my head's battered, you know. Um, and we're hardly, none of us are hardly eating anything. Kayum can't cook anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, comes Sunday night. I hear a tap downstairs. So I'm like, whoa, me, gone, see you later. <laughs> I go downstairs. I look through the door at the bottom of the stairs. I see him, sir, outside. Good, I've gone to the window, open the window. I've gone, uh, what are we doing? Because I'm expecting him to say, oh, you know, I've got somebody and you can go. Yeah, and he's gone, um, no, it's bang on top, uh, we're going to go out and shoot him. Oh, mate. Yeah, so I'm going, now, I'm, I, and more, right, shit, what am I going to do? Right, so I'm going, look, that, yeah, well, you, did it, you don't want me for anything. You know, I haven't got a gun, I'm not going to be the one that's shooting him, you know what I mean? So I've gone, listen, mate, I have I've to go, to, I needed to go to Luton, really, because of the court case on the Monday. But I made the excuse that I need to go to Leicester to try and get away from them. Yeah, he's going, no, no, we'll drop you off at Leicester, yeah. Go and get, so, you know, just to get me, me head off it, he's going, go and get, um, they couldn't find the back door key, yeah, to open the back door. Go and get a screwdriver to open the lock off the back door. So I go out, shock me, brother Azzy's there, 
I'm going, what are you doing here? And he's going, what are you doing here? Uh, so, uh, you know, after we've done that one, uh, I've gone, this, uh, we'll deal with this lady, give me a, a, um, a screwdriver. I've gone, I've taken that off. As I've taken that off, they're coming down. I go in, I sit in the front passenger seat. My brother's driving. Them two are in the back. And uh, the diplomat, uh, Mr. March, was in the middle. We're going uh, along to Leicester now, at the M69, wherever it was. As we get closer to Leicester, they're telling him that they're going to release him, uh, whatever, they're looking for a spot. If I, say we get off the motorway, they find a, a, I don't know, they find a spot uh, going down this road. It looks like, um, you know, one of these little B roads, it's dark, it's February, you know what I mean? Mm. Dark, I, you know, I mean, I, I just don't know what to do. Um, he's, they've got, they've gone out. He's gone, stop the car. They've gone out. We've gone, turn the car around, come back. As we've come back, and we've gone quite way up as it goes. As we come back, them two are running down the side of the road. Yeah, and they've done the deed. Yeah, I found out later on. Um, Kayum had a cut on his finger. Apparently, Masara had said to him, "Hold him, and I'm going to shoot him." Yeah, he's found out he's going to be shot. He's got hold of the gun. They've started fighting. Yeah, he's got Kayum's finger. Kayum must have tried to hold him. Got his finger in his mouth, going proper like that. You know what I mean? Anyway, they've done it. Where did they shoot him? Uh, once in, I think it once in the head, twice in the body. Uh, the guy and so just left him in the road. We thought it's a, uh, I thought it was a B road, yeah. Anyway, they dropped me off in Narborough Road, Leicester. I'm away, and but you know, everything that, that could go wrong, could possibly go wrong, has already gone wrong. Um, I'm walking back to my student digs thinking, what, what am I going to do? What, what am I going to say? My head's battered, you know. A anything that I had, you know, I, had the, I had a balaclava because I always catch the balaclava on. So I didn't want him to see me because I thought, you mm. know, he didn't recognize me. Yeah? So I chucked the balaclava, threw that in the river on the way. Uh, I go into my hall of residence. I go have a shower. I come back out, push some fresh clothes on. Um, I walk into our communal kitchen, which was the TV room, and there's an outside broadcast, the news is on. Yeah, the outside broadcast mm -hmm. is where we've just been. Between the time he'd been shot and you got home, yeah. how long was that? Maybe 40 minutes, 50 minutes, something wow. like that. And, I, and I'll tell you why this happened, yeah. So I've... Um, as I've walked in, all the lads, because they know I'm a Kashmiri, and I've got, I had a picture of, uh, I had a poster of my wall, but on my wall, but they, uh, then again, I'm not into like, let's get guns and, you know, shoot people and, th you know, mm. throw bombs and all that. So, you know, I'm just into having a good time and stuff like that. And, you know, if somebody's taking the liberty, I do want to stick up for it. I mean, that's, that's my, you know, kind of basic uh, outline. And uh, they're all, Mo, Mo, have you seen this? What's happened there? Bum, bum, bum. And I'm just, what are you talking about? And I'm just, you, you know, I may, you know I me, mean? I don't even watch the news. I've been out clubbing and blah, blah, and I've given it that one, yeah. But inside me, I'm like, oh, straight away. Yeah. And I found out later that that wasn't a road. That was the drive to a farm. Yeah. The farmer had taken his missus out for a meal on that Sunday night and they were on their way back. It was about 9, 9.30, something like that. And they found the body along the way. It must have been about 10 minutes after the guy was shot, something like that. They found the police, next thing you know, bang. Because it was like a big, big case. You know, and this was only the second time a diplomat has been shot in this country. Yeah. First time he's been assassinated. Because the Palestinians tried to do it in 82, which caused the invasion of uh, Lebanon. But yeah, they didn't kill him. You know, he was on life support for seven years sometimes. So this was a big, big thing, you know. And, and me, you know, like, I've given you a, a little history of my life, yeah. And, 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 you know, 
people don't know who you are, how you are, how you get to where you got to, you know, uh, and so they, they just see the facade that, 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 that you kind of, uh, that, that you wear, you know what I mean? Mm. So, uh, yeah, so, so then I'm thinking, shit, now I've got to go to Luton for the magistrates, go to Luton, get uh, after 12 o'clock, because I'm a student, I ain't got no money, so I'll get a single uh, return. Uh, I don't get to see my brother again. Uh, I get to see Masura. He uh, tracks me down at the um, college and he makes out, because uh, now I'm just like, you bastard, you know what I mean? You complete and utter fuckwit, you know? You know, how can you do that to somebody who, you know, is uh, supposed yeah. to be your friend? If you want to, uh, why didn't you ask me when you come and said, yeah, I'm all, we want to do this, you know, because he probably realised, oh, dog, are you nuts, you know what I mean? But, you know, the, the, it, it, and, and then he's, he's saying to me, I've gone, well, oh, what are you doing? And he's going, oh, I'm going to Wales. And I thought, he's probably going fucking opposite direction, you know what I mean? So then I go back to, oh, so the case gets adjourned for reports or something like that. I go back to um, Leicester and then for the next two weeks I try to act normal, you know, pretend that I haven't been involved in anything like this. And so that was a f on the 5th, day, the guy got shot. On the 17th of February, it was on a Friday again. So the Friday after? There's okay. two Fridays, I think, two Fridays. Two weeks after, two Fridays okay. after. Yeah, two Fridays. Mm -hmm. 17th. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> about a week and a half after something like that. Anyway, I get two policemen. Sorry. So I, uh, I get a knock on the door on a Friday. I don't have any lectures. So I'm just lying in bed. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. One mm. of the lads comes running, mo, mo. Uh, there's cops there at the warden's office asking for you. I went, oh, shit. I thought, I, I remember I, we had some Colombian weed and it was really good. And I don't know about weed that much. But I thought, oh, I've got some seeds here. I might be able to grow them or whatever. So I had some, <laughs> some seeds there. So first thing, about to throw them out of the window. I don't want them to give, uh, give them anything to, to, to hold me by. So uh, then I jump back into bed, pretend to be normal again. Forget that I've got the poster of McBull butt on the wall. But then even if I took it down, it looked dodgy anyway. <laughs> So anyway, they knock on the door. Um, yeah, who is it? Oh, um, can we speak to you? I say, yeah. So I'm just like in my underpants. Hey, what do you want, mate? Uh, and you can just see him. Look, and I, I've, I've got a poster of David Bowie. I've got a poster of Marilyn Monroe. And I've got a poster of <laughs> Mark Bull. But, and they've gone, bang, yeah. So they've gone, uh, we want to talk to you. I said, yeah, I'll come in. I'll make you a cup of tea. They went, no, no, I want to talk to you down the station. I went, all right. I said, uh, look, let me nip, nip across the road. I get a packet of fags. I nipped across the road. Uh, they, they let me go. They said, you know, if I, if I was, was going to run, that was me guilty, innit? it, you know? Mm. So anyway, they've, nabbed, they've took me down to the police station. Now, I had a bit of a weak alibi, which I knew would stand up to a little bit of pressure, but not much. When I went down to Luton, uh, there was uh, a mistaken identity case that pulled me in. And uh, some guy was driving taxis, the same name as me, on the same road. And I went, no. So when I came back, I told the lads, I said, listen, uh, I've, I've had this kind of issue. So if the cop has ever asked you, just say, I was with you guys that weekend. And I'd found out about the football game and everything that had happened. So, do you know what I mean? So, but I knew that, you know, if, the, if, if there was any evidence, it was over. But as long as there was no evidence, it would, you know, tolerate a tiny bit. So anyway, on the 17th, they take us in. Right, so I, I'm down there for 12 hours from 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. It's on a Friday. They go start looking for me alibi. They can't find anybody because everybody's out. They're on the rest. One of the lads, he's in the hospital, uh, Duncan. Yeah, he used to go kind of like... Um, all kinds of stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, he's a diabetic as well. So he's down there and uh, they've spoken to him and he said, I don't remember. I'm on a lot of medication, mate. I can't remember. So 
they come back and then they give that, oh, um, we're your mates. Uh, we're going to let you go. We don't have to, but we're going to let you go. But let us know if you're here. And I'm like, yeah, of course I'll let you know. You know, I'm your best mate, all of that one. So they let me go. And uh, they go, oh, we'll drop you off, would you? And I went, no, no, it's all right, I'll walk, yeah. Mm. They went, no, no, we'll drop you off, yeah. So uh, so I, they get on. So I just say, take them the opposite way to where I'm going. <laughs> We're going yeah. to the Wagon and Horses on the London Road. And I swear, yeah, we got to the bar. And, you know, you, you know how much when stress really hits you, yeah, they go... Uh, we go to the bar, they go, what do you want to drink? And I went, I'll get the pint of pills, yeah. And um, they got me a pint of pills and they got a pint each for themselves. And I swear, I knocked it down in one go without thinking, yeah. It just went, boom, and like that. And they've got a big gun from there and like it's on top. So anyway, um, I, and they're looking around to see if anybody's showing out to me, you know. That's what they were looking for. Anyway, they let me go. Then, then the coppers, uh, they pull me. And then after that, I start seeing two uh, men sitting in a car along the roads that I used to go where, you know, where I'm going to my lectures and stuff like that. Um, there's another two there sitting there um, where, where I, um, my thingy was. Um, my whole residence, the Royal Les Royal Infirmary was at the bottom. The prison was just there. And the football ground was just there as well. So the turnstiles, we got in there having a drink, two big beefy guys. You know what? When they're after you, you can spot them, mm. you know? So then they come into the turnstiles. Oh, the superintendent wants to talk to you. I've gone in, had a chat with the superintendent. He's let me go again. By this stage, they've caught one of the guys. Yeah, they've caught Kayum, the guy who was like with me there, right? How did they catch him? All right, so when they dropped us off, at Narborough Road in Leicester, they said to him, uh, he was supposed to be going to Bolton, he had some relative, they said, look, get out of the country. Yeah, as quickly as you can, you don't live here anyway, so get out of the country. Yeah. So I'm under the impression that they're all gone. So during this time, I think it was on the 10th of February, I phoned Luton, and I, I, I couldn't ring home anymore because I was hearing kind of noises yeah, on the phone, so I'm thinking they're listening. So then I was ringing this taxi uh, service where I knew the guys who worked there, I knew those behind the control, so I could talk to people there. And one of the guys says to me, he says, uh, Azzy's gone, and this on the 10th of February, Azzy and Masura have gone to Kashmir, and outside of Kashmir. When I say Kashmir, I mean the Pakistani occupied, they call it Azad Kashmir, not the Indian occupied part, yeah. So I thought, well, if they're gone, that means everybody's gone. If everybody's gone, then there's nobody to point, kind of point the finger at me, which gave me that false kind of sense of security. Kayum gets captured on the 21st, going to Holyhead. Sorry, from Holyhead to Dublin. Now, he wasn't to know, but that is the hottest route because the IRA were using that route all the time. So he wasn't really to know, but whoever's given advised him, yeah, he's got his, you could get a British visitor's passport in those days from the post office. Uh, he's got his cousin's ID and he's got it on that. And he's, he thinks he can go there and claim asylum because Ireland are against Britain. But obviously he doesn't know, yeah. So as he's going past and he's like trying to, you know, slink with uh, a couple or something, they pulled him over, pulled him over. They've opened his thing and uh, inside it, he's got his ID his real ID, yeah, and the credit card and stuff on his name, Kayum Raja, and then he's got this British business passport, uh, his cousin's name, Sark Raja. Like, yeah, mate, come here, let's have a chat with you. The other thing with him was, it's uh, quite a funny one. I know it's not funny, but he, he had this scarf, yeah, and this scarf had like really long fibres, yeah, mm -hmm. and it was like, a, you know, have you seen those macaws, you know, those really bright parrots, yeah? And I said to him the first time I see him, I'm me, I'm wearing all in black, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I said, where did you get that scarf from, mate? And he said, oh, I got it in the Pigalle, I got it in the flea market in the Pigalle. Yeah, that's very, you know, striking, you know? <laughs> so anyway, he had that scarf with him. Now, what had happened was that when they'd done the forensics on the body, 
they'd found this fiber of the, and there I was like, you know, bang on top of him. So that's when they pulled him to the side. A, they've got him that he has, he's not got the right ID. And B, when they've sent that off to match, that's match, so now they've got him. Now he's telling them the stories. After a few days, he's told them the story. Yeah, he's called me Mohammed. Yeah, but you know, by this stage, the net's closing in. Then um, we get to March the 1st, that night, February 29th. I've gone out. I think Pete Burns was playing Dead or Alive. <laughs> Dead <laughs> or Alive, Pete Burns, yeah, <laughs> at the Union Bar. I'm, I'm watching that, you know, and I come back and uh, they turned up. And, 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 and they were like, there was a. a one car load, they were like ZZ Top, mate. They had big beards. These guys were like six and a half for all of them, and they had big beards like that, you know what I mean? They would have been like the Taliban if they weren't white, you know? <laughs> so they had one car load of them, and they, because they've just come in, they went, uh, Mohammed Riyad? I said, yeah. He said, can we talk to you in private? I said, yeah, all right. Go in private, they went, right, you're nicked. Mm. Yeah, no, you know, uh, pace or anything like that. None of that. You're nicked, right? So I get in the car with them. They're taking me to um, West Brom Police Station, as it turned out. Along the way, there's PC Reynolds, and I think it's Turner or something like that. Uh, I've got the name. Uh, so one of them's like he's being the the friend. Yeah, I'd sitting at the back. The other one's turning around and punching me and then going like, we'll throw you out of the thing, we'll do this, we'll do that. But they're telling me the whole story, right? And not only are they telling me the whole story, they're telling me everything that I haven't done. Yeah, so they're saying, we know you didn't do this, we know you didn't shoot him, we know you weren't there, you know, we know. So, and it, it was like, and then I know that obviously somebody's said, yeah, so... Uh, when I get to the police station, Kayum's there, and this other guy, Sadiq, the one who came with Masarat when they asked me to come to Birmingham, he's there. They've got these paper suits, the forensic paper suits on, and they've, you know, obviously written statements and stuff like that. And so he's, yeah, bang on top, bang on top. What were you charged with? Uh, charged with um, conspiracy to kidnap to start with. Yeah, and that's, that's what the ad is, yeah. They didn't charge you with conspiracy to murder as well. Uh, in the end, they charged me with murder and unlawful imprisonment, but to start with, they just, I think it was just conspiracy to kidnap. Yeah, that was the holding charge. But then I was like double cat A and stuff like that. I was in police custody for a week. Yeah, and in those days, I think it was... I think, and that was the, you know, the uh, Prevention of Terrorism Act, 1975. It was uh, down to that. Wow, so there you have it. Part one with Mo. Yeah. Wow. We've got a conspiracy to kidnap that's going to end up in a murder charge. Yeah. And we've got the backstory, Kashmir, Luton. We've got the Charles Bronson story that we opened it with. His book is 300,000 words, which is 30 hours of audio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let us know in the comments mm -hmm. what you thought about part one today. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see part two? And please support Mo in what he's doing now. He's turned his life around from all I this stuff. Mm -hmm. He's got his channel. And are there any other places online you'd like people to support you? Any links we can put in? Any Socials. Pardon? Do you have any socials? Any? Social media. Social oh, media. social media. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I, you know what? I got kicked off Twitter for. God, <laughs> I, swear, I swear to God, this, how mad is this, yeah? <laughs> for calling rednecks rednecks. That's <laughs> why they kicked me off. I'm totally kicking me off. YouTube's the same. We've got to be very careful what we say. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm kind of getting onto that, you know, yeah. that, that how I use my language. So you're not on Twitter then? I'm you're not banned, on Twitter. Banned from Twitter. What about Instagram? Instagram? I'm not on Instagram. Facebook? Either. I'm on Facebook. Do you want me to support your Facebook with this and your yeah, YouTube? Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, my Facebook's yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mo Johnny Yen Rias. <laughs> Send that over then. All yeah. of Jen's links are down there in the description yeah. box. Yeah. And huge thank you for watching this today. Let us know what you think in the comments. We will see you next time. Take care. And um, yeah, give us a hug, Mo. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a brother. I'm a hugger. Group hug, group hug, group hug. <laughs> <laughs>
Well done, cheers. Thank you. Yeah.